Everyone knows that the survivors of the sinking of Titanic were saved by a ship which sped through the night to their rescue from very far away. You know this even if your only exposure to the Titanic saga is James Cameron's 1997 movie Titanic. But what you're less likely to know, although let's be realistic, if you're watching this channel you most likely do, is that there was another ship so close to Titanic as she sank that many people on her sloping decks saw it in the distance. This ship was the Leyland Line's SS Californian. Probably for the sake of cutting down length or streamlining the narrative, the Californian's very existence was entirely left out of the movie. As a consequence, many people don't know anything about this other ship, which was much closer to Titanic than the actual rescue ship Carpathia. And this begs the question, could Californian have saved all or some of Titanic's victims? It's traditionally a controversial topic and can easily become very complex, if you allow it to. In this video, I will do my best to answer the question without allowing it to get out of hand, and certainly without purposely muddying the waters as often occurs in this debate. On the evening of April 14, 1912, Californian was eastbound in the middle of the North Atlantic on her usual route from Liverpool to Boston, Massachusetts. Although she sometimes carried a small number of passengers to boost revenue, she was primarily a freighter and was only carrying cargo on this particular voyage. Californian's sole wireless operator, Cyril Evans, sent out a message warning other ships of ice in the vicinity. Titanic's wireless operator, Harold Bride, heard the message, but did not acknowledge receipt nor did he write the message down, but rather continued his demanding work of transmitting the private messages of passengers, which was Bride's primary duty. Fifteen minutes later, Bride picked up the same message from Californian, this time intended for the ship Antillian. Ship's time was 1937. This time, Bride wrote the message down and delivered it to the bridge, where he handed it to First Officer William Murdoch, who was covering for Second Officer Charles Lightoller so that the Second Officer could take his dinner. Both ships, Titanic and Californian, continued on their respective voyages. Titanic, traveling at this point in her maiden voyage, at a speed of over 22 knots, would have been slowly overtaking the small freighter as the evening pressed on. At approximately 22.20, Californian encountered an ice field, more than just the sporadic ice spotted earlier. Her captain, Stanley Lord, made the prudent decision to stop for the night so that they could navigate the ice in the light. In the meantime, Titanic pressed on at full speed. By 2300, Titanic had largely closed the gap in distance between herself and Californian, so that the next wireless transmission from the Californian was exceptionally strong due to the two ships' proximity. This message was sent by wireless operator Cyril Evans from the Californian at 2307, and read, MGY MWL, I say, old man, we are stopped and surrounded by ice. Aboard Titanic, the sound of the Morse code blasted into Jack Phillips' headset. Already irritable from being tired and overworked, Phillips replied angrily, Shut up, shut up, I am busy, I am working Cape Race. Meaning that he was busy sending passenger messages to shore via the wireless station at Cape Race in Newfoundland, which relayed messages to New York. Unsurprisingly, this last ice warning, which is arguably the most important of all, was not relayed to the bridge, and was entirely ignored aside from the irritable response. Around 2340, just a half hour later, two things happened almost simultaneously. Titanic sideswiped an iceberg, opening her hull to the freezing Atlantic water, and Cyril Evans shut down Californian's Marconi wireless set and turned in for the night. 47 minutes later, at 27 minutes past midnight ship's time, Captain Smith leaned into the wireless room and calmly asked the operators to send the international distress call. Jack Phillips, the senior wireless operator on Titanic, took over from the junior Harold Bride and began executing Captain Smith's orders. CQD, 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 MGY, MGY being Titanic's call sign. Several ships would answer the call for help, but Californian, her wireless apparatus shut down and her only operator turned in for the night, would not be one of them. This may have come at great disappointment to Titanic's crew. You see, her officers and some of her crew, indeed even some passengers, knew that there was a ship close by, because it was visible, or at least its lights were, from the deck of the sinking ship, albeit perhaps barely visible. Still, Titanic was not quite alone that night, and her leadership knew it. 
Titanic's crew attempted to communicate with the unidentified ship with Morse lamps, lanterns specifically designed to flick light on and off, allowing the user to communicate with a savvy onlooker in Morse code. While it was later determined that Californian had seen the signals from the Titanic's Morse lamp, there was no response. Californian's crew later testified that they thought the Morse signals to be nothing more than a flickering mast light. Distress rockets were subsequently fired from the boat deck to try to get the unknown ship's attention, or possibly any other ship which might be within range. The large rockets exploding into bright white stars high above the water were much harder to miss, and these rockets did their job. They caught the attention of the officers on Californian's bridge. The officers went to alert Captain Stanley Lord, who was napping, fully dressed, on the settee in the chart room adjacent to his cabin. He asked the officer whether the rockets might be company signals, to which the officer of the watch replied he did not know. Captain Lord gave orders for the officers to try to contact the other ship, which they thought to be a large liner having seen her lights earlier, with a Morse lamp. Captain Lord did not go to the bridge, and instead remained in the chart room. Californian's Morse lamp signals were not picked up by Titanic, and in fact, Titanic's crew had given up on trying to reach the unknown ship with their own Morse lamp signals by about 1.45 in the morning, although at least one more rocket was fired afterwards. Despite the failure to establish communication with the ship firing rockets, the wireless operator Cyril Evans was not waking up to try to establish contact via the Marconi set. Californian's second officer Herbert Stone, who was the officer of the watch on the bridge at the time, remarked to apprentice James Gibson that the ship they were looking at from their own bridge looked, quote, queer, and appeared to, quote, have a big side out of the water, unquote. After some time, specifically around the time Titanic's resilient lights finally went out, Californian's officers on the bridge noticed that the large ship in the distance had disappeared. Some time later, the officers noticed more white rockets in the distance, this time from a different ship. These were in fact the rockets fired from the deck of Carpathia as she approached the position of Titanic sinking to reassure the victims that help was on the way. At approximately 4.30, Chief Officer George Stewart reported to the bridge on Californian for duty and spoke with Captain Lord about what the crew had seen over the night, at which point they finally woke up wireless operator Cyril Evans who shortly thereafter learned that the famous Titanic had sunk nearby, the very ship he had been in communication with just before retiring to bed late the night before. It was then that Captain Lord gave the orders to start making way for Carpathia, who was at that point busily carrying out one of the most famous rescue operations in history. By the time Californian made it to the scene, Carpathia had already rescued all of the survivors from the lifeboats, and was hauling out as many of the lifeboats as possible onto the ship. There was apparently some confusion amongst Carpathia's leadership though, and it was thought that there might be one more lifeboat with survivors in the water, and Captain Arthur Rostron of Carpathia asked Captain Lord of Californian to search for it. After a thorough search of the area, Carpathia was about to get underway for New York, but Rostron asked Californian to conduct one final sweep of the area for any last possible survivors, which Californian did, but with no success. When there was nothing left to do, Californian continued on her voyage to Boston from which her crew was collected for the United States' official inquiry into the sinking of Titanic, ongoing in New York. So the question remains, could Californian have saved the victims of the sinking of Titanic? Strictly speaking, the answer is maybe. It is often presumed that it was within Californian's reach to go to Titanic's aid and save every single person who was not trapped below deck, some 1,500 additional lives. But with missing, incomplete, and contradictory information surrounding the exact circumstances and conditions of that night, it is difficult, if not impossible, to determine, with any degree of certainty, whether or not it was feasible from a technical perspective for Californian to recognize the situation for what it was, make a plan and a decision, and safely navigate to Titanic's location, and then safely and effectively take on all Titanic's passengers and crew. It seems a little counterintuitive to suggest that Carpathia, which was much further away from Titanic, and in fact heading in the opposite direction at the time of Titanic's distress signal, was in a better position to reach the sinking ship than was Californian, which was literally within range of the naked eye. However, Californian was stopped with her engines shut down, and the middle of an ice field had a much smaller crew and a much slower ship. She was many miles away from Titanic. 
although the exact distance is very much up for debate compared with Carpathia's 58 miles. The most important thing to note, though, is that in order for California to have saved more victims than Carpathia did, she would likely had to have arrived on the scene prior to Titanic's final plunge, because a person can only survive in water as cold as the Atlantic was that night for a few minutes. Carpathia did not arrive until 4 o'clock in the morning, nearly an hour and a half after Titanic ultimately foundered. Californian would have had to beat Carpathia there by nearly two hours in order to make a difference. And that's being optimistic, given how complex and chaotic such a rescue could have been. The U.S. Senate inquiry into the sinking of Titanic concluded that Californian could have gone to Titanic's aid in time to save more souls, but this conclusion is at least a little dubious. But none of this exonerates Californian or her crew from blame. At the end of the day, they still failed to go to Titanic's aid, whether it would have made a difference or not. The conclusion and subsequent recommendations of both the American and British inquiries are damning for Captain Stanley Lord. The American inquiry recommended that it be made a misdemeanor to fire rockets at sea for any purpose other than to signal distress, indicating its belief that this is the only appropriate time to be firing rockets at sea, and hinting that Captain Lord should have come to the same conclusion on the night of April 14th slash 15th, rather than thinking that perhaps they would be company signals. The British inquiry recommended that captains be reminded that it is a misdemeanor to fail to go to the relief of a vessel in distress. A reminder because it was, in fact, already a misdemeanor to fail to go to the aid of a vessel in distress, per the Merchant Shipping Act of 1906. We know that Californian's crew saw Titanic's distress rockets, and her crew said as much themselves. While Captain Stanley Lord apparently wondered whether those rockets might be company signals, this would have been highly unusual. There is even reason to believe that the officers on the bridge thought the ship from which the rockets were being fired, Titanic, to be in distress. Second officer Herbert Stone's remarks to apprentice James Gibson that the ship firing rockets in the distance looked, quote, queer and appeared to have, quote, a big sign out of the water, is jarring and frankly damning. In summary, Californian's officers witnessed a ship steaming through an ice field, which then abruptly stopped. Soon after, flicking lights were seen from the ship, followed by bright white rockets fired at regular intervals from the deck of the ship which appeared to have a large side out of the water before ultimately disappearing. From this, the officers apparently concluded that it might be a ship stopped for the night firing company signals, which happened to have a flickering mast light and then later disappeared, maybe continuing on its voyage in the middle of the night despite having a large side out of the water and being in the middle of an ice field. In the Titanic community, there have been, and continue to be, attempts to clear the names of Californian's officers with the introduction of obfuscating information and theories. These include suggestions of other mystery ships in the vicinity, unusual weather phenomenon, the misalignment of the clocks aboard Titanic with those aboard Californian, and so on. I've read entire books outlining this information for a research paper I wrote in college, and while all interesting, None of it cancels out the fact that Californian's bridge officers saw rockets fired continuously from a ship in an ice field that they themselves had stopped for, and noted that the ship appeared to have a big side out of the water, yet failed to take any action beyond attempting to establish communication with a morse lamp for more than four hours. And worst of all, the root cause of Californian's failure to respond to Titanic's distress was, and this is admittedly conjecture on my part, laziness on the part of Captain Stanley Lord. I don't place the blame for the loss of hundreds of lives on Captain Lord. That would be simplistic and also misguided, given the uncertainty of his ability to save those lives to begin with. But it is important to note that he did not know that his opportunity to save those lives was dubious. It could just as well have been the case that his inaction was the final nail in the coffin for 1,500 souls. This would have been the case if Titanic took, say, four hours to sink rather than two and a half. While he laid on his set T in the chart room, Captain Lord chose to take that chance. It brings me no pleasure to speak so harshly of a man who has long been dead, but Stanley Lord's inaction stands in sharp contrast with the heroic actions of Captain Arthur Rostron of Carpathia, something you can learn more about in my video on that very subject from November 2019. In case you are wondering what happened to Captain Stanley Lord, he never was charged with the crime, but he did eventually lose his position with the Leyland Line, if for no other reason than to protect the image of the company in the eye of the public. He was able to find employment with other shipping lines moving forward, though. So what do you think? 
where Captain Lord and his officers responsible for the tremendous loss of life in the Titanic disaster, or are they unfairly scapegoated for their unfortunate role in the events that night? Leave a comment below to let us know what you think, and thank you for watching. <laughs>